birth to, to not just knowledge, but revelation knowledge that will transform our lives, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I think, you know, um, you know, we've just come out of this sort of lockdown again and we're so used to that we're becoming a bit flexible, aren't we? Hopefully, yeah. hopefully flexible yeah. um, through this time. Um, even though there's so much going on, I don't know if you, you know, again, we talk about this a lot, but on social media, I think when the Spanish flu happened in the 1900s, they didn't have social media. media and I'm, I think they're quite thankful Thanks, that God. they didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there's a lot of polarisation happening and, you know, all these different coercive tactics and, you know, all in the name of God. I like how we label, put God's name and attach it to something that perhaps, you know, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't have anything to do with, but we put his name against something that we so desire to be an opinion that we think is from God, if you get what I'm saying. So, and so for me, it's about being careful not to be distracted or a way, you know, distracted from the truth of God's word. And I think this morning, I want to remind you, and it's something we have to do, is constantly remind ourselves of our destiny and our hope in Christ. And I suppose, if anything, would say to you, what is your focus this morning? What are you focusing on? And I think one of the things that we've been doing, if you've come along to our Thursday, Thursday morning, we've been studying the book of Romans. And the book of Romans is just so rich in explaining our Christian faith and how to live it. You know, Paul must have been a remarkable, remarkable man, but a remarkable man of the spirit as well, as he just surrendered to the Holy Spirit and heard from him and just began to write. And in the 16 chapters of Romans, I think it has 16 chapters, am I right? Yeah, thank you. There's a chapter right in the middle called chapter eight, and it's midpoint. It's like sandwiched in there. It's like pivotal. Uh, chapter eight is pivotal in under our understanding and walking out our daily Christian life. It's like it's sandwiched in the center to remind us what has gone before, but also to remind us what is to come. And I think Paul put it there because it actually gives us perspective, perspective of the future or perspective ahead and perspective about what has gone on before. And so I want to this morning just unpack one of those scriptures, you know, a few verses, sorry, out of chapter eight of Romans. And what's so great about Romans is if you go home and read it today, it says things like, um, set your mind on things of the spirit. Okay. So if any season that we need to do it, it is now because we are overwhelmed by so much that's going on around us. So let me encourage you to set your mind. So that's a decision you need to make on the things of the spirit. And he even talks about being led by the spirit and walk by the spirit. And so it's all about that engaging with the Holy Spirit and not being overwhelmed by so many things. He actually talks about don't have the mind of the flesh. So we can get distracted in the mind of the flesh, but he actually even reiterates that we have the mind of the Spirit. And so he's making a statement, you know, in fact, really, if you start at verse one, he says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, you know, who walk according, you know, and you know the scripture. And he then unpacks that scripture. In other words, he reinforces it, brings foundation out to actually show you that you have the mind of the spirit, that within you, the Holy Spirit dwells. And there is so much, so much of the promises of God that we need to, um, I, I suppose, reiterate and reawaken within our lives. But I want to read out of chapter eight, and I'm going to go for verses 28 to 30. And Paul says this. So chapter eight, Verses 28 to 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What an amazing verse. I'd love to get inside Paul's head. I'll just, you know, be able to write some of the truths of the spirit. He says, and we know for those that love God, all things work together for good. Those, he means all of us. It's not just me. It's not just Mark or Steve or someone else. It's actually for all of us that are children of God. So he's actually saying, we know that intuitively, out of our relationship with God, we know beyond doubt that he works on our behalf. 
And that word love is agape, and it's in the present tense. And it's actually saying it's a habitual lifestyle. So those that love, all of us that love God, are the habitual lifestyle of love before God. And he says all things. So every aspect, aspect of our lives, no exceptions. All things, not some things. God is able to make even our sufferings work together for our good and his good. He works them for good together, not in isolation. And that word together is actually comes sort of from the English synergy. You know, come together. God is continually working on our behalf, causing all things to work together for good. God will cause everything in our lives to become beneficial, spiritually profitable, useful and good. God is working in and through all things for your good. And someone has actually used this example. I thought it was a great one. It was like with table salt. It has two poisons in it. It has sodium and chlorine. And yet you combine, they become very beneficial, you know. And so often that's what happens. So if you go to some of the verses previous to this, it actually says that we are heirs and that we will share in the sufferings and his glory as well. And so often when we go through things, we think, oh, that's not God. But that it might not, but it's an allowance of God so that we would be heirs of the son, you know, co-heirs with him. And so God works that situation in for, for the good of you and for the good of God as well, if that makes sense. So when you're going through trials or tribulations or, you know, things that just really irk you, how many have had things that just really <laughs> irk you up the wrong way? Okay, well... God is working in through that, the synergy in that to come together to actually do something significant in your life. The text does not say that the things are good, but that God works them for good and he weaves them for our ultimate good, okay? So they might not necessarily be good, but God works them for our good because there's a destination that he's after and we want to get the verses in this, this particular passage you'll find out what your destination is for those called according to his purpose. We love him, the love of God. So that's the human side. The God side is the call. So he invited you, he appointed you, he selected you. You can't do it without the call. You can't really love God without the call of God. And the call gives life. It awakens us. We were dead in our sin, but the call awakens us. We, we, and when we are called, we are justified. So it's like this call that goes out. Um, we're called and awakened to Christ, not for our purpose, but his purpose. We have made, been made dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we've been a called according to his purpose. And, you know, I think that call, I really believe that call goes out consistent, consistently and constantly. It's more that we actually have got to open our ears to hear the call. We actually have to listen. So God is calling out to all of us, you know, whether you've given your heart to the Lord or not, he's still calling out and he's calling them to himself. For he foreknew and he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. That word foreknew, he foreknew. In other words, he chose a relationship with you. You know, he knew this was going to happen. He was going to have this intimate relationship. You are called for relationship and predetermined decree marked out. So in other words, when he talks about he also predestined. So he foreknew that you would come to him because there's a constant call that goes out continually. Come to me, my child. And he predestined you to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. The goal is to be conformed to the image of God. That's the goal. We are sure that everything works together for our good because he called us, he chose us, and he predestined us. God's plan for us is that he chose us, that we could have a vast family. He predestined the chosen to be conformed in the image of his son so that his son would be the first born of a great family. The aim of predestination is to have a divine family with many children. So God predestined you so that you would be conformed to the image of his son. Listen to this out of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, 
that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. He chose us in love for adoption. The predestination was God's design to fulfill a purpose that we would be conformed to him, his, his image. That's your destiny, to be conformed to the image of Christ. To conform to his image. Listen to this out of uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. He is the image of the invisible God. So that's Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the four, firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And what is God desiring for us is that we would be conformed into the image of his son, which is the image of his father. Yeah. Isn't that, and that's the call and that's the predestination of everyone who loves God who is a child of God, the image of father. So the image of the son, the, the image of the son is the image of the father. And, and what God desires is that we would be conformed to his image. And that in that sense that we would be also glorified. Now, listen, I think this is a little bit earlier in Romans chapter 8, verse 12. He says, so then brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. If by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body and you will live. Verse 14, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. So this morning you're a son or daughter of God because you are led by the spirit. You have the spirit living within you. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery. So he's making a statement here this morning to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So this morning, you have received a spirit of adoption as a son and daughter of God, for whom you cry, Abba, Father. There's a cry that comes out. So the Holy Spirit within us and our spirit joined together to cry out to Abba, Father. Verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided, look at this is qualified, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. And that whole process here, that whole statement is so that, so that you would be made in the image of the son. We are heirs with Christ to be conformed into, in, into his image, to share in his suffering and his glory. So how do you get conformed? You know, that's an amazing word. It's like we've got to open ourselves up. Conformed means transform you know, perhaps you need to be taken apart, dismantled, deconstructed, like Mark was just sharing before about the foundation. Everything has to be deconstructed once our form exists. However, but we need to open ourselves up or else we can shut ourselves off. Mm -hmm. So even as a Christian, we can open ourselves up to be conformed into his image or we can shut ourselves down and shut him off. And Paul actually says in Romans 12, verse 2, do not follow the pattern of this world, but be reformed by the renewing of your mind. The indication is that the reformation proceeds from God. So we cooperate. We're in partnership with God. So this, so this reformation will happen within our lives, this continual renewal of the mindset. Um, we recognize, the, you know, you can't recognize the will of God unless you have that renewal of the mindset happening and that we become more like Christ, conformed in his image. That's your destiny, to be conformed into the image of Christ. And it proceeds from God in that sense. So we're in partnership to enable that to happen. It's like we must abandon the world so the form of God gains its grip within our lives. So it's like we've got to let go and let God do what he wants to do to work all things together for it. He's good and our good in our life. So when you're going through things and you think, oh, it's the devil or, you know, that's a bad thing. Often it's God saying, I'm walking these things in your life together in synergy so that you can be conformed into the image of his son. And so often we push away, you know, especially when they're bad things. When they're good, we have no problem. Yeah, true. When, there's, when there's trials and trips, we actually go, why God? And here's your explanation. Because he's working the good, the whatever you want to call it, 
the trials, tribulations, whatever you're going, he works and he brings them all together in a synergy. He weaves them all together so that out of that, you're conformed into the image of Christ. What an amazing picture. Because he actually says, that's what Jesus happened. You're an heir. Of, if you're an heir and a co-heir with Christ, the same thing's going to happen to you. I want to conform you to not just the image of the son, but it's the image of the father. That's what he wants. He wants you to look like him. Isn't that amazing? We are formed by God, you know, into his image. And eventually this verse goes on a little bit. We'll get there. But it talks about being transformed to be glorified. That's the end result. The body will be glorified as well. Uh, Paul actually said uh, in Galatians 4.19 that Christ is formed in you. It's like we have to yield so that he can mould us into his image to be transformed so our behaviour, our thinking, our willing, our feeling, our focus, our attitude, our beliefs all need to be conformed to the image of Christ, being like-minded like him. And it's like this two-sided process. It's, it's us partnering with God to enable that to happen. And in fact, there's a deconstruction so that he can construct so we allow him to deconstruct us so he can construct. Morally and spiritually, we're being conformed. So the spirit is changing us from the inside out to be more like his son. Listen to this from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of, degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. And in Philippians, it actually talks about that we'll be physically transformed when that time comes. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. But our sorry, citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject to be subject to all things. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, we are now children, uh, are God's children now, and what will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. We are destined to be glorified. Isn't that an incredible promise? The reason I'm reiter reiterating even this scripture this morning is that we get so distracted. We don't realize the promises that are in this chapter eight of Romans. We don't realize the promises of scripture that towards us. And not only that, these are statements. These are statements of fact that Paul is making about you and me. No matter how you feel, like um, Steve was saying, it's not about the feeling. What is the word saying? The word is saying this morning that you are an adopted son, that the same spirit that dwells in you is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And that God's goal as a father, as we cry out, Abba, Father, he's saying, I'm going to make you into my image if you let me. So we've got to allow the deconstruction to happen. And that's part of, that's the hard process. So we are destined to be glorified. And yet we get so caught up in the things of the earth. We get so distracted from the social media and whatever else you want to watch. But he is saying, God is saying this morning, I'm calling you out and I'm calling you to be destined to be glorified. The predestination is, is to be called justified and glorified. So you've been predestined to be justified and glorified, to be conformed into the image of, of his son. It's to be glorified, sharing in the glory of his son. So it's morally and spiritually transformed in the character like Jesus, but eventually the physical body at the same time. The goal is to be conformed into the image of his son. And it takes us to cooperate with him. Imagine that image. It actually means a visible manifestation of an invisible heavenly reality. So really, while we're here on earth, Father God's in the process of conforming us to the image of his son. Isn't that amazing? So that we would be the visible manifestation of his image. Think about that for a moment. That's pretty crazy, you know. The reason for this plan, the purpose is so that we would be adopted into his family so that many sons would come to glory, you know, to him, you know. It's, Jesus was the firstborn so that we could have a big family. That's what it was about too, that you would be glorified 
and justified, but it's also the call that goes out is that he longs for you to be a part of his family. Verse 30, and those he predestined, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. Those, he means everyone who is called a child of God. And here's a chain of verbs that he links together, built together. They're like intermeshed all together between predestination and glorification. We have been called and justified. In other words, he's called you and he's justified you. You have been, this is your, this is what the, it's, uh, uh, it's your destiny. You have been predestined to be this, to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, when we start talking about destiny, especially as Westerners, we talked about what am I going to do for God? What's my calling? What's my gift? But if you read these verses, it actually puts everything in perspective that you're actually called, you are predestined, called, chosen, you know, um, justified for this reason, that you would be conformed into the image of his son, that you would be part of his family. This is how God sees it. Yes, those gifts are good and everything like that. Call is good. But he's saying, God sees it like this. He says, I want you to be a part of my family. And I want you to take on my traits. You know, like when you have children and you're horrified when they start doing things that you don't want that look like you. You know, or you remember you'd start doing things that look like your mum and dad. But he wants it in the sense that you become like in the image of Christ. And that's what it's about. We have been justified by the son, the flesh of Christ. Sin was put to death and we've been declared not guilty. We have been declared justified. And it's that sense of solid foundation, that security, that assurance, that all things work together for good because we are foreknown. We are called, we are justified and glorified, which is the conformity into the image of his son. The goal is that, to be like him. The transformation of the body is the fruition of sonship. And this morning, I just wanted to encourage you and say, where is your focus? I would really encourage you to go home and read Romans 8, because what it does will bring everything back into perspective that you truly you have the, the spirit of God, that you are led by the spirit, that you are a son and daughter of God, that his whole purpose is that he actually called you and he called you to be, be conformed into the image of his son. He calls you to be like Christ. And the things that you are going through are part of that process because he's working them all together for his good and your good so that you would become like the son in his image. And that should be our actual focus this morning, you know, should be where we should be directed our, our hearts and our lives and every part of us. And I, this morning when, I, you know, I started to think about this even during the week, I thought I need this just as much as everyone else, just to encourage each one of us to keep our focus and why we're here. We're called to become like Jesus here on earth. And it may be even think about, you know, some things we just got to keep constantly reminding ourselves of what the word says. Yeah. And there's, you all know the scripture in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, and I'm going to finish with this. And he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And I think from what I've been looking at, I find that some Christians think we do wrestle against flesh and blood. <laughs> but we, we wrestle against rulers, authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Never forget the authority that you have and why you're here on this earth. You wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, you know, against the spirit realm. And so I just wanted this morning to encourage you, to remind you that this whole process, even what you're going through right now, even if you found the last two weeks really hard, that part of that is God is conforming you into his image and he's actually bringing all the tapestry together. It's like you bring every thread together to weave this incredible tapestry of who you are, that you are created in the image of his son and the image of his son is created in the image of his father. And so God's heart is that you would be an adopted son and daughter in his family and that you would take on his likeness. And part of that conforming to his likeness is that he works everything together for good. God does it, not us. And it's for his purpose, 
not ours. But isn't that amazing? You're a part of this incredible family and who's brought us. And to me, as I read it, I was getting revelation. I thought, you know, I'm missing something here. And the fact that this is a call upon us, because often we get messed up in all the, about that. We think, you know, I should be doing this. Or I'm called and, you know, you know what I'm saying, guys. Yeah. And really, God, right here in the middle of, this, of, this, of Romans, he's actually saying you're called to be like him. Yeah. If that's all you fulfill in life, he said, that's cool too, because you've, uh, you've allowed him to come and, you know, conform inside you. He's constructing as you're deconstructing. Mm -hmm. And usually when you go through things, it's where, that's when the deconstruction happens, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for your word. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Father, that you are conforming us into your image. Lord, and this is the call upon our lives. This is our destiny, Father. And help us to keep everything in perspective. Lord, especially in this season of our lives, it's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to get overwhelmed. And Father, I pray that even during this week, every one of us will re be reminded of the fact that you have called us, you have chosen us, you have predestined us, Lord, to, and you have justified us to be made into the image of your, of your son. So we just thank you for that today, Lord. And we just release your presence in and amongst us, Father. We pray, Lord, that even through this time that some of us may have started, you know, there might be different forms of deconstructing going on. But Lord, you speak to us by your Holy Spirit, Father, that we would set our minds on the things of the spirit and not of the things of the flesh, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, God. Thank you.